Hey, this is Eric over at Techno RV, and this is the RV Electrical 090 seminar. So, uh, so Electrical 090, uh, let's talk about that. Uh, this is what we're going to cover today. What is Electrical 090 first? Basic electrical terms, uh, different electrical systems in the RV, and tips to protect your RV from bad power. So these are the things that we're going to, to cover today. So what is electrical 090? So you know when you get out of high school, you go to college and you go to English 101? Uh, well, there's also a course called English 090. And, uh, and that is if, uh, if you don't really qualify to just go straight into to 101 and you need a little more help with your writing skills, they send you into 090. So uh, this is the basic of all basics that you could get as it relates to electricity in your RV. If you're an electrical engineer, you might be a little bit bored, but I feel like that, that it's important that all RVers learn these simple basics about electricity and how it relates to your RV. So we're really going to get into that at a very basic level today. So here's the things that we're uh, going to get into as it relates to uh, electrical terms. We're going to talk about volts, amps, and, uh, and watts. Uh, we're going to talk about 30 and uh, 50 amp RVs, and we're going to just, we're going to talk about wattage availability uh, as well. So let's get right into that. So we know that electricity is the flow of an electrical charge, and uh, that electrical charge begins with voltage. So what is voltage? So here's my example here. If uh, you look on the screen here, uh, the, the red-faced, uh, frowning face here uh, is an electron, okay? And I made it uh, an angry face because it's negative, right? And this is how I remember it, so maybe it'll help you here. So a negatively charged electron, okay? This is the basis for voltage. And so if I uh, get a lot of negatively charged electrons all tightly pressed together, then they're going to want to repel against themselves. So if you think about it like uh, magnets, unlike poles attract and like poles repel. So if I get a lot of negatively charged electrons tight together in a single environment, they're going to want to repel each other because they, they are like poles, just like a magnet. Uh, so how do these electrons uh, come to be like in a battery? Uh, it's, a, it's a chemical reaction. In like uh, solar panels, it's uh, photons from the sun. We won't get into a whole lot of that, but just remember voltage is negatively charged electrons, and the more of those that you push together into a small space, the more they want to repel against each other, and the closer they're pushed together, the larger the force between them grows. This force that we're talking about is electrical tension. And the higher the pressure on that electrical tension, the higher the voltage. If I can get that voltage high enough, then I'll have the electricity that I need to run the components in my RV. Let's take a battery as an example. Remember, uh, creating uh, these electrons within a battery is a chemical reaction. And let's go ahead and fill this battery up with negatively charged electrons. Now you can imagine once that battery gets full, the electrons are wanting to flow, but they have nowhere to go at this point, right? But all of those electrons in there, that's the pressure, that's the voltage. If I give that, those electrons a circuit from one pole to another pole, what's going to happen? They're immediately going to take that path, as you can see. That flow of the voltage across that circuit is measured in amps, okay? So we talked about voltage, and now we're talking about amps. So amps is the flow of those electrons across a circuit. 
So remember, volts measures the pressure or the force under which electrons move, and amps measures the amount of electrons passing a given point every second. That's the current, right? But what's a watt? All these are terms of measurement. A watt measures the usage of electrical power. So let's take that battery again. We've got, we've got the battery full, right? We've charged it to, to its max, and we've got the flow of current now. And then, let's say we just light up a light bulb. This current's going through our RV, our electrical outlets. We plug a lamp in, the light bulb comes on. Uh, that light bulb is, is in what it absorbs in electricity is measured in watts, okay? So, have you ever tripped a breaker in your RV? If you've RV'd long enough, then the answer to that's probably yes. Why does that happen, right? So, we're using so many different components uh, in our RV, and obviously, if you uh, use more than what is available, then breakers are in place to protect you. So, if you're using more draw than is allowed, then that breaker will trip. So, but why is that? And that's because of, you can see these components here on the screen. And one thing you may notice about these are these are all like heat producing uh, components. And those are the ones that require uh, the most watt, watts to operate. So like sometimes you might see like a hair dryer and on the side of it, it might say like uh, 1700 watts. And so that means it needs 1700 watts in order to, to run that. So it's all about watts and uh, making sure that you don't draw more than your RV is designed for. So here is a formula that I never thought uh, that I would ever care about or need to know anything about whenever I just lived in a uh, sticks and bricks home. Uh, but in an RV, this formula becomes very important and it's volts, we know what that is now, right? Times amps equals watts. So let's look at how this formula plays out as it relates to your RV. The volts is a, should be a steady number, okay? 120 volts is what we're looking for, right? Now you might be at 118, you might be at 122, but as it relates to this formula, you should make the assumption that you can hold 120 volts. So that number will always stay at 120. Times amps. You're either in a 30 amp RV or you're in a 50 amp RV. So if you're in a 30 amp RV and you know you're running at 120 volts, you multiply those together and you have 3,600 watts of availability. Now, if you have a hair dryer that uh, pulls 1500 watts, then you can just subtract that from that 3600 watts and uh, whatever's remaining there is what you have left that you can use in your RV. So you start thinking of all the components that you have in your RV and in a 30 amp RV, 3600 watts is, is the number that you need to stay below. Now 50 amp RV is a little bit different because you still have 120 volts, but in a 50 amp RV, you have two 120 volt lines uh, that are split to each side of your RV. And so it's, it's really 120 times two of those lines times now 50 amps. That's 12,000 watts of availability. So if I just did 120 volts times 50 amps, that would be 6,000 but there's two of those lines, so it's 12,000 watts of availability. That's why these big RVs have the, you know, you, you get uh, three air conditioner units, you get like the, the cool fireplace, the big residential refrigerators, and so that's why they can do this, is because they have 220 uh, volt lines times 50 amps. So keep that in mind, it's very important, especially if you're in a 50 amp RV, and there's only a 30 amp uh, pedestal available because you're used to consuming a lot of power, but now if you're gonna plug into that 30 amp pedestal, now you're back down to 3,600 watts, right? So 
This is why it's important for an RVer to kind of understand this, this uh, formula. And this isn't something that's like, uh, oh, hey, I just learned this and I'll, I'll never think about this again. As an RVer, this is something that you should be considering when you are at an RV park and understanding the power consumption and what you have available to you. So let's look at some common electrical items in your RV. And you can just kind of uh, browse this list right here, uh, but you'll probably notice that again, the, the heat producing items really eat up the wattage. Uh, you know, that microwave oven, your, your, uh, your coffee maker, um, toasters, Oh, your air conditioner units, some big RVs have like washers and dryers in them. If you're going to plug in a portable heater, uh, then you're going to need to know uh, its wattage and do you have that availability. Uh, some time ago, Tammy and I were, uh, we had a fifth wheel and we had this little space heater that we would use from time to time and we would plug it into a wall outlet and the breaker would pop. And so but what would happen is if I would unplug it from that uh, receptacle and I would go to the other side of my RV and plug it into a receptacle over there, then all of a sudden everything was good. So why is that? And again, it's that 50 amp RV. Remember, it's got 220 volt lines coming into it. So what I was doing is I was unplugging from this line, plugging into the other side that actually had more availability for me on the other side of the RV. So uh, if you're ever tripping a breaker on one side by plugging something in, you could try the other side and see if you have more availability on the other side of your RV. So an RV electrical system has uh, basically two types of power and uh, for the most part. And that is uh, one is called direct current or DC and that means the current is direct in one direction. And then the other one is called AC, and that's alternating current, sort of this back and forth thing. So remember that, DC and AC, you're gonna be using them both in your RV. So let's take a closer look at that. So on the AC side, what is that and where does it come from? So AC comes from your power lines, that power pedestal that you, you plug into. And your DC power comes from your batteries. Now, also, if you have a generator, your RV will see the power coming from a generator the same as those power lines. It's AC power, okay? So whether it's power lines or a generator, that's AC, DC, that's coming from your batteries. So which items in your RV typically run off of the AC power? So your air conditioners. Uh, it's, it's usually your, your power hogs are what runs off AC power. And uh, so your air conditioner, your wall outlets, because uh, you may have a, a microwave plugged into um, a wall outlet, uh, your TVs, your res residential refrigerators, uh, the big residential refrigerators will be AC, washers, dryers. Again, energy hogs are generally AC type items. Your DC items, those things that are powered uh, from your battery bank are things like your, your lights, uh, uh, fans, um, some slides like water pumps, uh, some refrigerators, not the big residentials, but some refrigerators will be DC power as well. So I love this slide right here because it shows the flow of power into your RV and how everything from your AC items to your DC items are powered. Like, how does this happen? I'm, I'm plugging into shore power in this example right here, or I'm running off my generator, because again, remember, those are both AC. This is the originating source in this example right here. I pull into an RV park, I plug my RV into the power pedestal. So, the power comes in from the shore power. It goes through a transfer switch, which if you have a generator, a transfer switch basically manages the power between uh, your power pedestal and if you have a generator. If you don't have a generator, you're not gonna have a transfer switch like this. So, uh, but let's say you do, 
and but you're plugged into uh, shore power it goes through the transfer switch and from there the power goes to the breaker box so wherever your breaker box is everybody should know where that is in their rv and uh, if you don't you should go look for it uh, but you've got a breaker box so that power goes shore power to the breaker box from the breaker box it goes out and powers all of those AC dependent items in your RV. So this is going to be your outlets, your ACs, all these things we talked about that are AC. Now if my originating source for power in my RV is AC, the power pole, right? How in the world am I going to power my DC dependent items when I only when my originating source is AC? So let's follow the logic here. The power comes in. For my DC items, that AC power is going to hit something called a converter. This converts power from AC to DC power. From that converter, it goes to your batteries. This is going to keep your batteries nice and charged up, right? From your batteries, it's going to go to a fuse panel. So AC power goes to the breakers. DC power goes to fuses, like in a, a car. You have a fuse panel in your car, so you have this in your RV as well for your DC power. Once it hits the fuse panel, from there, it goes out and powers your DC dependent items in your RV. That is the flow of electricity if you're in an RV park and you're plugged into shore power. In this next example, let's say you're off the grid and you're running on battery power. You're not plugged into that shore power only battery. I still got to power my DC items and I need to power my AC items. So how in the world does that work? Well, let's take a look at it. Your batteries, the power from your batteries goes to your fuse panel, just like it did in, when you had AC power. It's going to your fuse panel and from your fuse panel it goes and uh, powers your DC dependent items. Nothing really changed there. But for the AC dependent items, Power goes from your battery to something called an inverter. A converter transitioned AC to DC. An inverter transitions DC to AC power. So from the inverter, it goes to my breaker box and then to my AC dependent items. Now, if you don't have a way to keep that battery charged up uh, and you're running a lot of AC dependent items, it's going to be a short trip. Okay, so a lot of people may use like uh, solar panels and uh, things like that uh, or run a generator to uh, keep their, their battery charged. Yes, solar power. Some people do wind power uh, and that, that is converted to keep that battery level high so that you can continue to stay off the grid. Uh, another option there is uh, you can turn your vehicle on and, uh, and charge your battery, uh, but uh, that is not always recommended because uh, that happens through the alternator in your vehicle. And an alternator is really designed to kind of keep a battery topped off. So only use that as a last resort because if your battery is like really low, and then you're going to turn your vehicle on and try and charge it with your alternator, that alternator is going to run a lot hotter because now it's trying to charge a battery up from like a low level. And uh, the, that doing that over and over would reduce the life of your alternator. This is just a funny, I saw this somewhere. Uh, touching wires causes instant death, $200 fine. <laughs> so I don't know who came up with that, but again, uh, the point here is, don't touch live wires. Uh, it can cause death. And apparently, in Newcastle, you will get charged $200 after you die. What can go wrong with power? So, we know kind of how power is generated. We know how it flows through our RV now. Uh, we know about availability and all that, about like, hey, I'm in a 30 amp or a 50 amp. How much wattage availability do I have? So what could go wrong? Well, unfortunately, a lot. You can have low voltage and high voltage type issues. Uh, you can have surges, of course. Uh, 
and you can just have poor uh, electrical wiring at a campground just to name a few so uh, when you go and plug in to a RV parks pedestal there should not be an assumption ever that that is uh, stable solid properly wired power uh, and if you've RV'd long enough then you know this the most common thing that RVers will experience is low voltage and we'll talk about that in a little bit but let's talk about some of the common pedestal problems that you can have you can have a uh, open ground situation and we're going to talk specifically about each one of these open neutral uh, accidental 240 reverse polarity power surges high and low voltage let's look at these individually on a 50 amp wiring remember you've got two hotlines and you've got a ground and you've got a neutral if you have an open ground situation this means that the ground wire is not connected or it's not corrected proper connected properly and it can certainly cause serious injury a ground is there to expel excess energy if you have some kind of spike or something that excess energy needs to go somewhere you want that excess energy to go to ground if there's no ground it's going somewhere this means that it can charge something in your RV that shouldn't be charged with electricity and it can create an electrocution situation you need to have a proper ground and at the RV parks the pedestal it should have a proper ground open neutral situation okay so now the neutral line is improperly wired or it's missing completely in a 50 amp RV you have 220 volt lines coming in they share one neutral and the neutral line is the return path the power comes in it needs a return path uh, to go back out and it's all the way back to the service panel if you're if if you lose that neutral in between your 50 amp lines those two 50 amp lines can come together and create 240 volts usually the way it'll present itself is on one side of your RV you may have 200 volts instead of 120 and on the other side you may have 40 volts uh, so you know both sides are in trouble certainly the side that is 200 uh, volts is anything in its path it's it's going to destroy so if you've got a computer plugged into a wall outlet or something like that it's going to be a problem so losing the neutral line is not good and it can certainly destroy electronic components in your RV pretty quickly reverse polarity this is when the hot and the neutral lines are wired in reverse now this can happen at the pedestal and if this happens at the power pedestal if somebody had wired that improperly that means everything in your RV is now in, in a, a reverse polarity uh, status the problem with this is is things will still work let's take an outlet for example that that the hot and the neutral line is is reversed what will happen is is you let's say you've got a toaster plugged into that outlet that has reverse polarity and the toaster is in the off position because it's the the wires are reversed even though that toaster is in the off position the coils could still be live so uh, you're, you you make some toast it pops the toast gets stuck in there and uh, and although you should never stick a fork or a knife in there to get uh, your toast out let's say you do you go in there and you've got a reverse polarity situation that would not be good power surges when you think about electricity certainly the most terrifying thing that you can think about is a power surge a lightning strike um, uh, you, you know something that there's just a lot of electricity storms coming through uh, this can also happen because of 
the power company having equipment problems. It's just this instant spike. It lasts only for just a split second and then it's gone. But in that split second, it can really just destroy everything in its path. Power surges are not that common. Uh, we did a survey not too long ago and just asked, uh, there was 3,000 participants in this survey and the number of people that had, had experienced like a true power surge, like lightning had hit close by, uh, it, it was like under 2%. Now, if that happens, a lot of times there's not a whole lot you can do because power surges can come up through like the, the jacks in your RV. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that can happen. Chances are you're going to have a problem with electronics in your RV if you take an extreme spike and you haven't protected your RV uh, with some kind of surge protection. Low and high voltage. Okay, this is the most common thing that RVers will experience in an RV park, specifically low voltage. So we get in an RV park, it's a packed park, it's in the middle of the summer, everybody's cranking their ACs on, that voltage comes down. The electronic components in your RV are designed to be operated optimally at a particular range. So low voltage would be considered anything below 102 to 104, something like that. Now we like 120. Uh, but anything below that 102, 104 range, that's considered low voltage that could be damaging to your, the electronic components in your RV. And the problem with low voltage is this. There's rarely a time that there's an immediate cause and effect from when you have a low voltage situation and your microwave goes out. But what does happen is low voltage reduces the life of your electronic components. So now you wake up one morning, your microwave doesn't work. You don't have anything to attribute it to, so you just think, hey, my microwave just, it's at the end of its life. Well, it could be that you've been experiencing low voltage and you reduce the life of your microwave and one morning you get up and it's just not working. So we gotta protect ourselves against that too. Uh, keep that in mind, low voltage, very important for us to protect ourselves from low voltage in our RVs. How can you protect yourself? So, uh, the experienced RVers are gonna know this. New RVers don't know this. Uh, some people don't care and don't think that, that it's an issue. Power at RV parks, if you travel enough, will be a problem at some point or another. So you need a device in between you and your RV and the power from that power pedestal. So uh, I personally use in my RV the SurgeGuard uh, brand electrical protection system. So there's units out there that are just surge guard units, surge, surge units. They'll protect you against a surge. But you remember I said that's really not, that, that's not the most common thing. What we want to do is make sure that we get something that can identify uh, low voltage, high voltage, miswired pedestals. And that's what a total electrical protection system will do. Some companies call it total electrical protection. Some call it energy management systems. You may see the term EMS. Uh, there's all different kinds of terms for it. It all means the same thing. They're all mar marketing terms. It just means that it's going to do way more than just protect you against surge. And that is what you need for your RV. Let's take a look at it a little closer. And I'm going to be talking specifically about the surge guard unit because that's what I use. If you know anything about Techno RV, uh, first of all, we only sell at TechnoRV.com what we, what we use. We test all, most of the units out in the market on a particular item that we're going to sell. We determine what we think is the best, and then that's what we use. There's certainly other uh, brands out on the market. You might see Progressive and, and Hughes and, uh, and even uh, uh, Camco is another brand. But I personally believe that Surge Guard is the best unit on the market for a lot of reasons. We'll talk about that. Here's what this does. A total electrical protection system, when you plug it into the, to the pedestal, and then you plug your RV into the uh, total electrical protection system, and then turn the breaker on. It's going to analyze the pedestal. It is going to, th this, this uh, analysis of the pedestal will take about 10 seconds. 
Uh, some other units on the market may take 136 seconds, some take 128. The surge guard takes about 10 seconds. In that 10 seconds, it's checking to make sure you've got a proper neutral, a proper ground, no reverse polarity issues, and making sure at the time that you don't have any high or low voltage issues. Immediately, all those things that I just explained about problems that open neutral, open ground, reverse polarity, all these issues that I just said that can be a problem, they're not a problem anymore. Because let me tell you something, if you plug this surge guard unit in and, it, and that particular pedestal's missing a ground, it's not gonna let power through to your RV. A message is gonna come up and say you got an open ground. You're gonna go to the manager of the park and be like, this has got an open ground. They'll either send an electrician out or they're gonna move you to another spot and you should insist on it actually. So all those wiring issues, problem resolved with a, a, a total electrical protection system. It's gonna protect against surges as well. Now, a surge again is that instant spike, right? Uh, we do want to protect ourselves from that, even though that is uh, not the most common thing that would happen uh, to you. You, st you do want to protect yourself against that. So, uh, so a surge protection unit can absorb excess energy of a spike through something called a MOV. MOV. It's a it's a, a metal oxide varistor, and uh, depending on how many of those MOVs are put into a particular surge guard unit and how much excess energy each MOV can absorb will determine how much of a spike that that particular unit can handle. Uh, the, surge guards, the surge guard units uh, have one of the highest uh, levels of protection on the market based on how many MOVs they have in their units and so I like that about them. All right, so we talked about this low and high voltage protection and low voltage being the more common thing that can happen to you in an RV park. And we talked about why. These units, these total electrical protection systems will identify if your voltage drops below a safe level that's safe for your electronic components in your RV. If you drop below that level, it's gonna cut you off from that. These are usually short term events and these units will reanalyze power, and once that voltage comes back up, then it will cut your power back onto your RV. So if you're gone for the day and this event were to happen, uh, maybe you've got a pet in the RV or something, yes, these units are designed to come back on should they cut you off from, uh, from low voltage or these high voltage situations. And again, low voltage would be anything below around 102, and high voltage would be considered anything uh, above 132. So see, high voltage is, is different than, than a surge. A surge is that, boom, split second, uh, huge spike, where high voltage is just like anything above, like say around 132 volts. Now, here's one of the reasons that I like the surge guard unit. It's the only unit on the market that gives you something called load side protection. And what that means is, is that this unit can not only protect you against things on the line side, that means that things coming from the pedestal, but it also protects you against things on the load side, which means inside your RV. So if you had a scenario uh, where you had elevated ground currents or an open neutral condition inside of your RV, the surge guard unit will be able to identify that and cut you off from it. Remember, a 50 amp RV, if you lose that neutral, those 50 amp lines are coming together and creating 240 volts. You need to be able to be cut off from that or you will certainly uh, have some electronics that are not gonna be in good shape. So again, the surge guard unit is the only system on the market that will do that and it's one of the main reasons, among, among other things, it's one of the main reasons that uh, I believe surge guard is the best unit on the market. The surge guard also has a dual line display on the unit. It's going to tell you uh, how many volts per line uh, that you have. So it should be 120, but you know, uh, you know, you could have 115 or, or 125 or just whatever the voltage is. It's going to tell you per line. And then uh, also how many amps are you drawing off of each line? So it will tell you that. 
uh, as well. So that is good information to know uh, considering now that we know kind of that whole formula of volts times amps equals watts, uh, you're going to be able to know now the voltage uh, and the amperage that you're drawing from uh, that line. SurgeGuard has the best warranty on the market, hands down. It's another reason I love it. It's got a, a, a lifetime warranty. It's considered a limited lifetime warranty. And what that means is that uh, for a lifetime, if there's any uh, uh, components or craftsmanship or anything that uh, aren't operating up to the standard of what it should be, then that, that's just covered for a lifetime. But it has what's called connected equipment coverage. And what that means is that is if this unit fails to do what it was intended to do, and because it failed to do what it was intended to do, something in your RV got damaged, like a microwave or something like that, SurgeGuard, the company, will actually uh, pay for the cost of whatever that was. So uh, a great, great warranty. So that is the SurgeGuard uh, Total Electrical Protection System. Certainly, if you have more questions about that, then you can call uh, Techno RV, you can chat with us, you can email with us right from our website at, uh, again, technorv.com. We've got more information on electrical protection. We've got info guides on our site. So listen, I hope that this seminar was helpful to you.